All right. So again, my name is Janie Mitchell. I'm housed at the other end of the hall. I'm actually housed in education leadership, but I work under the dean's office. And I was hired um, about two years ago in a part, into a part-time position to help faculty and students find external grant funding. And um, evidently, they liked the work I was doing because the, the position was um, expanded into a full-time position, and now I'm here all the time. So. That gives me the opportunity to actually work with more groups like yours, and I'm really excited to be um, in, to be uh, invited to, to be here today. I've got some opportunities coming up I really want you to know about. Plus, just to let you know about my skill set and, and the, the fact that I'm available to help with grant applications if you're interested in writing for funding um, or if you have questions. So a little bit about myself. Um, I am the grandmother of 16 grandchildren. Five of which were born just this year. So our family is exponentially, you know, growing exponentially, which is a lot of fun. And it's my favorite thing to do. When people say, what's your favorite thing? I love being a grandma. I do. But it doesn't pay the bills. So that's why I'm here every day trying to not only um, support faculty, but also the students. My background is in... Boy, if you drew my career path, it would take up this entire whiteboard. And it would take some really interesting twists and turns. You fit I, right in with this group. I, you know, <laughs> it's really interesting. But let me tell you, it's none of it's wasted. None of it's wasted. I can look back to jobs that I crashed and burned at that turned out to be critical for what I'm doing now and for what I want to do in the future. I'm not done yet. I actually just applied for the education leadership doctoral program. So we'll see. We'll see. I may be adding graduate student to my, to my tagline. Um, but what's exciting is that if you, if you go into life with this idea that I'm gathering skills, I'm going to put these skills in my toolbox, and it won't matter what I'm actually doing day to day. If, I'm, if I've got those skills, I've got the deep capacity to really do a lot of cool stuff. So I started out in community government. I worked for a, a, a group of county commissioners in Oregon for 20 years. And in that time, I began to do grant writing as kind of a side thing. I found that we didn't have some of the resources that we could have in our county. And there was money available to provide. Um, this is when the um, American with Disabilities Act was just coming out. And there was money to be had to renovate public spaces and I began writing for those big um, block grants to do redo the courthouse to improve our parks to put bike lanes I love the fact you're doing bike back things I did I actually we did bike lanes in our hometown and I worked on the bikeway um, master plan which was a lot of fun really didn't have a lot to do with my day-to-day -day job but I was interested in it and no one else was doing it and so I jumped in and I started working on my skill set as a grant writer um, I went from there on into higher education and have worked in the community college world for, oh, it was about 10 years in the community college world. Um, then a little distant in higher, or in uh, K-12, and now I'm back to higher education at the university level. And I love being back at, B at BYU. This is where I did a lot of my undergraduate work years and years and years ago. I will not tell you when. but. Um, suffice that the library was still new back then. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's great being back at BYU and I really love the opportunity to work with proposal writing and grant writing and we're going to talk a little bit more about how that's kind of a, a, a skill set that you definitely want to put in your pocket. You definitely want it because it's not something that's taught directly. You have to glean it and gather it kind of indirectly um, and hone it as you go along, but it's a really important skill. So now you know more about me than I know about you, which is not fair. So what I'd like to do now is just quickly do a circuit of the room and try and include our folks um, that are um, on the other side of the virtual wall to make sure that we kind of know um, a little bit about each other. And if you'll just tell me, because everyone says, when are you going to graduate? Is that a painful question? If I ask you to tell me when you're planning to graduate, is that painful or is that okay? <laughs> if you don't like to do that, tell me something else about a goal. If you don't want to talk about graduation, say, 
I'm planning to do this in six months or whatever. Just tell me your name um, and something something you're working towards in your future. We're going to start it here. My name is Nick Gubler. Uh, in six months from now, I hope to be in an internship somewhere. Um, but I'm really interested in evaluation, creativity, and innovation, um, um, and having instructional design as, uh, as my skills on the side. Cool. My name is Kevin Johnston. I'm a master's student. And uh, I'll hopefully be starting my project in the fall. Um, and we'd love to talk to you about potential funding for it. Cool. My name is Shanda Gubler. Uh, and uh, six months, I'll probably be working in a project, so I'll probably go down the research route as well. Um, my interests are uh, corporate uh, development, and uh, yeah. That's hot right now. Corporate anything with intellectual properties and corporate development is hot. This is Matt Armstrong. Um, I graduate next year, I think. Um, I'm interested in, in design and a lot of other things, hopefully that will narrow down. That's great. My name is Karen Arnson, and I have four grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Trina Harding, and within six months, I hope to have a better idea of what I will do. <laughs> there you go, yes. see? No deficit thinking. No deficit thinking. Um, I'm Isaac Plager, and I will graduate this summer. Congratulations. I'm Sam Jackson, and I plan on graduating sometime in 2019. And knowing before that time what my hands are after graduation. <laughs> okay, all right. And is masters or doctoral? Masters. My name is Esther Mahela. Um, I hope in six months I will get a chance to present something at the ACT. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Jacqueline Jung, and I'm in doctoral program, and I. Actually, just talked to Dr. Rice. I want to switch from parrot to corporate. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, I can graduate within five years. But hopefully, <laughs> it's all right. Five years will be here whether you graduate or not. <laughs> just keep the ball going. Keep it moving. I'm Hiram Brown. I'm a master's student. As well, and hopefully, I'll be graduating in the spring of next year. Okay, great, terrific. Let's. Go, um, yeah, just go back to the back. Faculty? Is there a mic back there? Okay. Yeah, there's only one student. Okay. I'm the only student in the back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Bob Bodily. I graduate with PhD in April, assuming my committee is not too harsh. <laughs> I defend March 1st. And what else was I supposed to say? Remember? What are you working on? Anything exciting? Uh, just submitted an SBIR grant uh, with a few friends from the program um, in the middle of a faculty job search. Although no offers so far. And got a job as a data scientist for a company up in Salt Lake. Okay, well, terrific. All right, and I do recognize a few of the others in the back. Good, good to see you all. Thanks for supporting our students. Let's go ahead to our, our folks um, on, the, on the screen. If you can, if you have the capacity and willingness, tell us who you are. Probably need somebody first come here and then tag them because they might not all be able to see. Uh, oh, I see that. Okay. Um, let's see. Who's got there? Let's start with. Let's start with oh, Tasha. <laughs> Hi, Tasha. Just checking in. How are you? Hi, how are you? <laughs> so, what do you do? You have a goal that you are look, working on in the next six months? Yes, I need to do a K twelve. All right. It's a big. That's a big bullseye. Okay. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That's good. Okay, all right. Not down. <laughs> all right. Okay. Let's go to Scott. Yeah. Hey, everybody. So, I'm Scott Harris. I'm working on my dog and um, I my name is more than what I do every day. And so in evaluation and research in that area. Okay, terrific. All right, let's see who we haven't heard from. Um, 
I can't quite read the first name. Powell. I see a last name. Is that Sandy? Hi, Sandy. Hi. Um, I'm an instructional designer for the Division of Continuing Ed. And uh, I'm working on an innovation project that I'm hoping to get funded within the next six months. Wow, that's great. Great news. Thanks for weighing in. Um, let's see. We've got, is Carolyn there? I'm not seeing Carolyn. Let's go ahead to, is that Bodana? Hi. Uh, I'm Bodana Almond. I, um, I'm a second year PhD student, and uh, I'm working on uh, online teacher professional development. Terrific. It's very important stuff. All right. And let's see who else we have. Cecil. Cecil? I'm Cecil Short, doctoral student. Um, Aquarius, enjoy long walks on the beach. Um, in six months, I hope to be wrapping up a design development project on an OER textbook that will guide K-12 in-service and pre-service teachers in figuring out how to blend their classrooms. Wow. Okay, I'm starting to get intimidated, guys. These guys are up on the stuff. All right, let's see, is Nate? Hi, uh, I'm a master's student, and I'm working on ways to improve teaching coding uh, to adult learners. All right. Did we catch everyone? Except for Carolyn. Oh, Jennifer. Or Keith. Or Keith. Jennifer or Keith or Carolyn? Well, hopefully you can all um, follow. This is a, a new format for me. It's kind of exciting. I have worked through translators <coughs> with uh, folks from Macedonia, but I've never worked in a virtual setting before. So this will be, we'll see. We'll see how we do. Um, let's go ahead and, and just kind of jump into what I've got prepared. Now, some of this is going to involve you because um, I'm not really into park and work. I just think that's kind of an old school way of doing things and doesn't always get the job done. So this will be um, hopefully a little more interactive than that. But I do want to also give you some, an overview. And I'll have these slides, we can have these slides sent out. I'll get them to um, Jason and have them sent out so you'll have them. <laughs> so don't worry too much about taking notes. So first thing I want to talk about is the fact that we are all pretty good academic writers. You don't usually get to the graduate school level, especially, hi Heather, especially at a um, institution like Brigham Young University without knowing something about academic writing. You've had to write your share of papers. You may be working on something that you're planning to publish. You may be working on your thesis or your dissertation. And that's all very, very good academic writing. But proposal writing is a little bit of a different animal. And I want to take a moment to just talk about the difference in proposal writing so you can begin to kind of get that different hat on and begin thinking about this in a slightly different way. So where academic is very scholarly and you've got that individual focus on this is what I'm looking at and it really doesn't matter if the rest of the world doesn't care because I'm going to show you why this is important through my research. It's also past oriented. Usually scholarly writing is about work that's already done, that you have already completed and now you're reporting the findings or you're talking about um, what, what you accomplished in your study. Um, it's also about theory and theses and how you're going to, how you did uh, prove or disprove or what the outcome was that was a little different than what you'd anticipated. Again, it's all very past oriented. And you're explaining to the reader the steps you went through and what methodology you followed and the conclusions you came to. And again, it's that very scholarly approach to problem solving and presenting your findings. Well, a grant is more of a marketing piece than it is an academic piece. And that may sound foreign to you because, you know, this isn't, this isn't, um, 
the Marriott School of Business. This isn't the marketing class. But grant writing is really, it is, proposal writing is about marketing yourself in some ways. So you have to think about that idea of, I'm going to present my ideas in a future focused way. This is what I want to do, and I want to make you, the funder, part of my team to make this happen. So you approach it with that attitude of, I can't do this on my own. I need the support of others to do it. How am I going to get that support? So having a service attitude, I'm here to help the funder complete their goals. If you approach it with that attitude, which it shouldn't be too foreign, we're all kind of in the service-minded uh, community here. But it really is interesting because if you go at that approach looking at the funder as something you can do for them before you think about what they can do for you, you're on, you're on the right road because they're really the ones with the power. They're the ones with the dollars, the ones with the money. So you have this service attitude. I want to serve the funder. I want to serve the community at large. I want to make the world a better place. I want peace in our time, you know, whatever that line is, they always say at the Miss Universe pageant, world peace. When you have that attitude, you're going to be able to show your ideas in a little bit broader perspective that gets beyond this idea of the individual passion, scholarly pursuit that we kind of think about with academic writing. Again, future oriented, what could be done, what needs to be done, where the gap is, how we're going to fill it, what we're going to do in the future. Project-centered, objectives and activities. Not, this is what we learned, but this is what we're going to learn and how we're going to do it. And it's amazing, I talk about this, and a lot of people think that that is just ob you know, obvious. But many of the grants I review don't do a good job of really laying out the objectives and the activities. It's either vague, or it the scope isn't reasonable, or it's just, it just hasn't really been thought through. And then persuasive rhetoric goes back to the marketing. We're selling the reader. We want to go into those pathos and ethos and, and really have those um, emotional appeals. So if any of you have taken a marketing class or have worked in any kind of marketing um, or have, have done anything in sales, you'll recognize some of this, these appeals, right? You're going to try to find a way to give them the data, but also to, to get that emotional appeal in there so they'll really want to be part of your team because you want to be part of their team. Okay, so there is a proposal development process. It's not something that is just, yeah, you never want to take this on in like a week. <laughs> Always give yourself some serious time because proposal development takes that serious time. It's kind of it's kind of like incubating something, you know, it's got to have time to grow and you've got to have time for review. But this is just an overview of this process. So a good idea, we all have good ideas, but is that good idea a fundable idea? We're going to take a look at what the difference between those two things. And then once you have what we consider a fundable idea, well who is going to fund it? How do you find those funders? And then once you've found a funding opportunity, you have to begin the process of developing that proposal. So working on pre-proposal activities, working on brainstorming, looking at your collaborators, trying to bring together that team that's going to poise you to be competitive in what is becoming an increasingly competitive um, grant market. I mean, it's amazing. We're looking at maybe 20% success rate in some of the big funders. So then, of course, there's writing the proposal itself. And sometimes people like to jump right to writing the proposal. But these other steps are really important. Revisions are very, very important. Leaving time for revisions are very important. Getting as many eyes on things as you can doing drafts, peer reviews, editing, submitting, and then being willing to resubmit. All really important. So this is kind of that process. And research development has tools to help with any of these steps. All right, so the first step. Okay, you look at that big matrix and say, oh, 
I don't even know where to start. Don't even know where to start. So I'm going to make it a little easier by giving you some first steps. First thing I'm going to do is pass this around. Everyone take one and pass it around. Hopefully there's enough for everybody. Um, and I want you to think about what you care about. For those of you in our um, video audience, you just need a piece of scratch paper where you can jot down some notes. What do you care about? What does your research audience care about? And where is the intersect? Is the research audience the funder? The funder. So research audience is a broad term. It could be, it could come right down to the funder, but it's also the people in the world that care about your research. Whether it's the funder or the consumer or the recipient, um, think about that end user. The end user. What is the intersect between what you care about and what they care about? So we call the sweet spot. So I want you to think about that. Jot down on the front of that paper I just passed out just a couple of maybe common commonalities between what you care about and what the research audience cares about. And if you don't care about anything, you're going to need to start finding a passion somewhere. Research is about doing the work you would do even if you didn't get the money. Even if it was just in a little tiny, tiny space of that that you would, you know, it was a huge project if you got lots of money, but you could still, what would you do even if you never got a penny? What would you still work on? What gets you up in the morning? And there's, that's, that's part of, that's part of the important work of this pre-development phase. Okay, so now we're going to go on to the next. So the next question is why should people care? Why should people care about what you care about? So we're going to do a little activity. Get the mental juices flowing. I brought bribes. Um, I wish they were real. They're not. Well, they are. They're chocolate. But anyway. So. They're really chocolate. They really are chocolate. They just, you know. Um, first, I want you on the other side of your paper. You know, two sides here. Write a brief topic sentence about the research you're interested in, and then write three to five reasons why it is important to the world beyond this classroom. And I'm going to about five minutes to work on that. and share so if we have any students that are not near other students I'm going to invite you to come join the front of the group from the front of the class because we'll have we'll follow this up with a parent share activity I did this right before I came. I decided to switch it up. I was going to do a different activity. 
And then I found out it was being used in a workshop I'm going to try and get you guys at, maybe invite you guys to attend in a month. And I didn't want to do to double dip. So I revised the screen and I just realized I didn't proofread it as quickly or as well as I should have. This is what happens when you do things quickly. Sorry about that. So there should be a right two, three to five reasons why this research topic is important to the world beyond your classroom. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, the problem is, I'll tell you a little true confessions here. When I was um, in fourth grade, they taught us to speed read using an actual, uh, at the time was high tech, was actual screen and a, um, boy, it must have been slides, slides of words being fed at different speeds and they would increasingly, increase, increase, increase it. And they taught us to speed read. And I got really, really fast. I can read about 300 words a minute. But you do that by ceasing to see really little words. You begin to actually not see what and why and that and it and if. And it really has been a problem for my proofreading all these years. <laughs> I have to other people proofread my stuff because I, I, I just don't see them. They just disappear to me. But I can read 300 words a minute. But that was high tech back then. You guys have come a long way in what we use in the classroom. All right, is everyone ready? You got your three to five topics, or three to five um, reasons. You got your brief topic sentence. So we're going to play a game called So What? Because the first thing you have to develop is a research, especially someone who's going for research funding, is a thick skin. So this is an exercise to help you develop a thick skin. Um, and I want, this is full participation, I need everyone to participate. We're going to do what we call a choral shout, and that shout is, so what? And I want, I want some energy, I want some energy, so ready, one, two, three. So what? Ooh, that was pretty good. All right, let's try one more time, ready? One, two, three. So what? All right. And that is the, that's what you're going to hear in the world. They're going to look at you and say, so what? We're going to work on that a little bit today. I have, again, some incentives. I'm going to toss these into the room. If you catch this incentive, you will have the wonderful opportunity to tell us your research interests, and we're going to respond. And then you're going to get a chance to tell us why it's important. All right? So here we go. I am really bad. I'm really bad at this. I'm a great grandma. I'm a really poor thrower. So let's see. I'm going to try and see if I can at least get one to that table. Come on, somebody. One to that table. One to this table. All right. Whoever's closest to grab. All right. So let's go ahead and start. Since we started introductions here, let's start so what here tell me your name again Esther 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 tell us just your topic don't go into your reasons yet just your topic teacher attitudes toward new developments in educational technology will affect the access that their students have to their technology okay attitudes will be impacted all right are we ready for our choral shout one two three so what why so teachers with closed off attitudes because they won't um, expose their students to the, this technology might um, negatively impact the access. I don't know, I'm using too many words, but um, the students won't get that experience with the technology and that will set them behind. Okay, okay, so your topic is focusing on student access and the reason it's important because they may not get access. Tell me a little more about what happens if they don't get access. Um, uh, I think it stops them from very well, bad things. <laughs> really bad things. Um, they, I, I think their opportunities are just limited when they don't see the options that are there, especially in technology and the way that the world is moving. Mm -hmm. 
technology and, and the ability to use it in a transformative way is uh, going to be essential to a lot of work opportunities that um, those students will have in the future. Okay. Do you feel like when you were a student you had access to technology? Um, yes. Okay. Did you see people around you that didn't? So where is this coming from? Where is this interest coming from? Um, my interest is coming from teaching pre-service teachers and um, giving them opportunities to learn about technology, like coding or computational thinking or things like that, and having them say, no, I don't ever want to teach this to my students, I don't have time, I've got too many other things to do, this isn't important for them, they won't ever need it, and, um, and they not only, like, block the opportunity for their students to even experience this sort of um, ideas, but they limit themselves and, and limit, you know, won't look at the opportunities in which they could use technology to make their life easier. Did you see what happened when she began to look at the story behind the idea? Your passion began to build and I began to believe I began to care. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do. Thank you very much for going first. That is not easy. That's not easy. Good job. All right. I just looked at the clock and went, oh my goodness. This is what happens when you let me talk. So let's go ahead and go to this table back here. And we're going to speed this up just a little bit. Um, so I, I guess it's not as much of a topic as but more of a question. Um, but so I'm wondering. Would switching library instruction to more of a self-service approach um, so students can sort of access help when they need it as opposed to one or two day sort of blocks of thing, would that be more effective? Okay. All right, ready? One, two, three. So oh, what? Right. Why is that? Why should we care? Um, because using the library, um, I mean, there's like so many people and resources that are like dedicated to helping students be successful and students don't generally use them. Okay. All right, so again, access. Again, act, making sure that that's available. Good job, good job. It's, I know this is silly, but it gets the brain going. It gets the brain thinking. All right, go ahead. All righty, so I am interested in narrowing the gap between grad student completion, so finishing your degrees, whether it be master's or PhD, and finding the right fit for a career. Um, I'll wait for the so what. All right, here we go, ready, one, two, three. So, so what? Uh, you heard it here, just as we went around in our introductions, there were several who were like, I don't really know what I'm going to do, I don't know what's right, I feel like this is definitely a degree I should be using, but I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, I feel like in a change of, by changing a, the pedagogy that we use, we can get students more out into the real, real world, thereby introducing them to companies, making them really get a good feel of, oh, this is what an accountant does. Oh, this is what somebody in, in an engineering firm from Boeing will do on a daily. Is this for me? It helps these companies feel like, oh, you know, I really like this kid. I remember this kid's got uh, this kid has gotten a feel for the company what we're about and and so I feel like this could be a huge money saver for companies because millennials job hop like crazy. Um, it helps students have more direction and guidance and, and feeling comfortable with what they're doing, what they're going to use it for. Um, and also for universities, it makes the students look like they're going to graduate. Or uh, like they're placing their students in actual careers, right? So. I used to actually work in this field, and we called that opportunity the current that pulled the student through the training program. Without the current created by that job opportunity, visible, right. you don't often get that momentum that gets you through. Very nicely done. Okay, thank you. Let's do a big round of applause for all of you. did not report out, I hope you still went through the mental process of what would I say if someone wanted to know about my research and then said, so what? You need to be able to verbalize what you care about in a way that is positive and passionate and gets the, to the heart of why we should care. Because 
academic research for research sake is really a dying species. They just you have to be able to, um, almost all the funders have what they call broader impacts or some kind of evidence that this is going to make a change in the world we live in. And it's important to keep those ideas and keep that outcome in front of you as you begin working on your proposals. So the first thing, next, the next thing is to figure out your essential knowledge. What do you know and what don't you know? And figure out what that knowledge gap is. Because you have to become an expert to some extent in this area of research. Enough that your background knowledge is sufficient to propel you into the next stage. So figure out what you know, what you don't know. If you don't know, who does? And how do, how do you connect with people that do know that? And that's really something that is an individual quest of your own. And you have to put some time into it. It's not something that's just going to come to you magically through the ether. You've got to put some time and some work into it. Know your research audience. Identify problems of practice that matter to you and to K-12 world, the corporate world, the university, the higher education. Figure out what matters and those problems of practice that people are either not solving or not successfully addressing. Um, identify research that will, you will do regardless of the funding. Where is your passion? What will you really you want to get to the bottom of this? And then you take that to a fundable idea. And you have to put it on paper. If it stays in your brain, it's not good to anyone. I have three novels in my brain. They're perfect. They're beautiful. But they are just in my brain. And sometimes you've got to just take that step and get them out on paper so you can look at them and mess with them and play with them. And it's going to be messy. It's not going to be perfect at first, but that's okay. So thinking in question format. I loved the one that came out as a question. That's a great way to be thinking. Um, Using that experiment research approach, how would I how would I test this? What would it look like? Using that hypothesis format of saying, well, I think this is what I'm going to find, but I might not, and so I need to think about what will happen if I don't find that, because some funders often want to have a plan B looked at in your in your proposal, and then keep a log of your ideas. Keep. Some kind of, whether you're doing an online journaling, whether you're doing notebooks, whatever you're doing, keep a log of not only the thoughts you have, the ideas you have, but also where the intersects are between what you're doing, what other people are doing. Um, collaboration is becoming more and more important in every single aspect of research funding. And if you get a chance to go to a, a conference or to meet with someone from outside your institution, Keep notes on that and keep their contact information because you never know when you will need someone who is an expert in that particular aspect and you, oh man, I went to that proposal, I went to that uh, conference and I heard that guy and I don't remember who it is. Try to keep an ongoing log so you have that information. And this is one of my favorite new sayings, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> That's the definition of a grant writer. Five minutes, oh my goodness. Funding opportunities start here. BYU offers funding opportunities for graduate students. There's the Graduate Students Office, the Kennedy Center, and then we also have a grants page on the MSE website. It's called Student Funding. And that's one that I've been working on. It's just a one pager now. We're gonna keep adding to it. Take some time, take a look at that. Um, also, understanding your career path and finding a spotlight for your career path, graduate fellowships are available on gradschools.com. That's kind of a great, um, it's a large, um, just a large look at graduate school funding. Um, Grants.gov has dissertation and early career support. And we have a website that is BYU, there's about four <coughs> research developers on campus that all kind of um, contribute to this. Researchdevelopment.byu.edu is the website. Look at the Getting Started tab. And we actually put on workshops throughout the year, and I'm going to tell you about one coming up. This is what the research development site looks like, and you can see that Getting Started tab. You're not in this alone. 
There are people at the library that can help you. Um, Emily, and I don't, I'm don't. i going to butcher her last name, Darwaski is uh, the librarian that is dedicated to the McKay School. And she can help you with And again, we're going to send these all out so you have them. Um, we are doing a proposal writing series for graduate students. March 8th, 15th, and 22nd are the days that are workshop format like this. And then March 13th is a day to learn about an online program called Pivot. That is an online search program. And they will actually do that in the library. You can learn hands-on. This is done during the noon hour. Um, there's no cost to attend. You do have to pre-register so you get pizza. Because if you don't pre-register, there's never enough pizza. So um, put that down on your calendar. We're going, I'm going to have posters in the lobby that will have more information. Yes. So is that this, the series you'd want to attend to all of them? Or? I would say it would be better to attend some than none. But all of them gives you the whole overview. It goes much more into depth of what I've just touched on. So I would say if you can get to any of them, get to them. If you can't, get to all of them. They're all little pieces of this overall workshop. Yes. If I don't have like a specific idea that I'm like working on a proposal for right now, is it so useful? This is all very basic how you start your proposal writing. We'll do some of the stuff we talked about today, but go into more depth. It's a good series. It's a good series. What time does it start at? It starts at noon. It goes from noon to, to 12.50, and it's going to be in the, oh, what's the building with that's in the quad near here that's got kind of that, set that. No, it's not that one. I was going to say Webster building, but that's not, that's the key building. I have it. I have it. I'll send it to you guys. It's in the one with the fishbowl that's right across, like oh, diagonal. Benson. Benson building. The Benson building. Okay, so here it is. Uh, the pivot funding, um, pivot, pivot training is in the Harold Dewey Library, 2233, on March 13th. And you'll get to learn about online. Um, and then I'll just send you this, but here's some links to look at. There's some funding coming up for graduate students. There's lots out there. Some of it's place based, some of it isn't. Um, and then this is a little more information about the graduate workshops. So W 170, the Benson Building, 12 to 12:50, starting March 8. Get online at researchdevelopment.byu.edu and register and come because I'll be there and I'll give you everything you didn't get today. Um, there's also a Fulbright presentation coming up on March 29th if you're interested in overseas. Fulbright's got some cool programs for students and. I'm here to brainstorm. I'm here. I'm just down the hall. Come find me. We'll talk. Thank you. Let's give her a hand.